Thank you all for, uh, for being here as well, actually. Uh, this is really an opportunity for us to share um, our findings, if you like, on what we think is a pretty important and seriously neglected um, issue. Uh, you'll notice that, uh, oh, sorry, it's not just a uh, uh, talk, we have a lot of opportunities for you to ask questions as well, to get debate going, uh, but also towards the, uh, as you'll see from the programme, towards the end of the, of the session, uh, we're going to have a, hopefully some group that we ask you uh, for your views about how we can take this project forward in various ways, and hopefully we can feed that in to any work we do, hopefully on some kind of national scale, possibly on a cross-national scale. I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, in a moment, okay. Um, as you can see uh, from the um, screen, we are we're low, low, low. Uh, we're, we're funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, Transformative Research uh, Scheme. Uh, so that's quite a coup. They recognise that this is a, it could be quite impactful uh, upon people's lives. Uh, I was originally at Manchester when I started Manchester University when I started this, which is where I met Maria. We since moved on to Bradford, <laughs> so we've gone. We've gone, um, if you like, cross-institutional, uh, and one of our, uh, uh, our group members, if you like, has actually moved back to Australia. She's now teaching in Queensland, did nursing in the periphery. Uh, so we've gone kind of viral and global at the same time. So from, you know, from this very small, modest beginning, uh, Maria and I meeting in a cafe, mm -hmm. the project, uh, thankfully, has actually grown. And as you, as you can see, we've rather grandly uh, given ourselves this rather wonderful logo, the Opus Research Group which is the older people's understandings, plural, of uh, sexuality. So that's a little bit uh, about us. Just to let you know that we are, uh, we're, we're nursing experts, we're sociologists, we're psychologists, and we have so-called lay members, one, one of whom is Stuart, who feeds a lot of concerns about LGBT people into our research. Uh, and sadly, we, 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 well, we do have someone with us called Kate Talkington, who's part of our team. She came through us through Manchester City Council, um, but the, 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 the project that she was representing has been a, 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 a casualty of the austerity bites, and they got rid of that particular group. But Kate, anyway, comes to us as a health, a health and sex educator, working particularly with uh, older people. So what we're going to do today, in the presentation of myself and Maria, is to talk about what motivated us uh, to do the work, uh, how we've gone about finding people, you know, generating, if you like, people's stories, uh, about sexuality in the context of uh, elderly care homes. Uh, we're going to share with you some, um, some distinct accounts of residents, but also their spouses. And the spouses kind of give us inroads into the stories of people with dementia who, whose capacity uh, to, you know, to consent uh, is, is kind of covered, really. And they, they give us that, that particular aspect that we cannot actually get from the person who is directly affected. Uh, but we're also going to share with you stories of uh, carers as well. And while there's some overlap in the kind of accounts that they actually give, there are some very distinctive noises being made from the three different perspectives as well. So I think the nice thing is that we are, uh, um, we're not just giving you one, one kind of perspective. And very often in a lot of research, the perspective of the residents is very often taken through the, the people who are looking after them. It's a kind of proxy kind of situation. We've been to, well, it's a very small sample, but we've actually been to people to find out what they think and feel about being an older person and intimacy and sexuality uh, within that particular care context. So why did we do the research? Um, well, uh, we did a, a kind of a literature search and we subsequently done a literature review. Um, and what we found is that um, it is a neglected topic. There's work done in Australia and in America. Uh, a lot of it is sexological. In other words, it focuses on functioning when you become old. And it kind of conveniently forgets about all the emotions and the relationships that might actually attach to that. So it looks at sexuality in a very kind of narrow and kind of, I think, rather degraded uh, way as well. Um, uh, one key note from a more critical reading of the event literature is by Trish Hafford Letchfield. Uh, and Trish has concluded that um, in, both in terms of everyday practice and also in terms of policy at the governmental and local level, that um, the uh, sexuality and intimacy and older people in care homes is sidelined and thoroughly uh, neglected. And that applies uh, even more, if you like, to people who might identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual or trans, uh, who when they go into care homes find that they have to re-closet themselves 
uh, and actually deny uh, an identity that they've actually spent a lifetime building in the face very often of hostility uh, and opposition. So that's, the, that's what's at stake here. Um, and although this is a little while ago, I think this particular story, this particular account still holds. But as Hodgson and Skeen have pointed out, the idea of old <coughs> people generally, care home or not, as sexual agents, as sexual citizens, is uh, uh, rare, rare, astonishing, and regarded as ridiculous. Okay? Still quite a widespread um, perception. Um, we were also motivated by, uh, th therefore, the need to address pe uh, older people's, and particularly care home residents, exclusion from the idea of sexual citizenship. Now, uh, this kind of appears implicitly in the work of Michael Bauer in Australia, and also Merrin Gott, who's now, I think, in New Zealand, but comes from Britain. Um, but in, in, in drawing on this particular way of thinking, they're, they're, they're drawing on ideas of uh, a well-known sociologist called Ken Plummer, who's done an awful lot around sexual difference and sexuality, who, and his idea is that sexual citizenship, it's a part of, of citizenship per se. It's about being recognised, it's about being validated as a sexual being. And we know that some people have been so, and quite a lot of other people haven't. So they've been excluded from that, that particular form of inclusion, if you like. Um, there is some literature that challenges um, stereotypes of later life. So you've got you know, your bungee jumping grannies and people going on, off to New Zealand to um, you know, life-changing experiential touristic experiences. And we get this kind of challenge from Chris Gilliard and Paul Hicks. Um, but what they don't actually say, say very much of in this kind of rather glorious theory is uh, sex and intimacy. That seems to be conveniently dropped from the agenda. And what we think is that it kind of reproduces this notion that old people and particularly those in care homes, are post-sexual. You know, they're no longer sexual uh, beings. Um, on a political level, I think as a group we realise that sexuality is a human rights issue. Um, but again, what we're picking up in the literature is that this is very often eclipsed by an over-concern, we think, with biomedical and psychological functioning. Now, these are important. We would not deny that for one moment. But they do tend to shade out a much more holistic consideration of looking at what the people need if they want to, <coughs> if they choose to remain sexual, but what do they, do they need uh, to maintain some kind of life that involves some meaningful touch and uh, intimacy. Uh, this has been raised, in, again, in the work on critical work of people like um, Michael Bauer, but also Paul Willis uh, down in Cardiff. So what's the context? Who are we actually talking about? How many? Uh, well, according to government statistics, ONS, there are 10.3 million people age 65 or over in the UK. Now, it's tempting to say only 4.5% of these people are actually accommodated in care homes. But let's not minoritise people. This still refers to just over half a million individuals. And let's not forget that these individuals are connected. They have significant others. They have wives, they have husbands, they have family, they have children, they have grandchildren. So a whole lot more people are affected uh, than appears at first blush. Uh, ageing is becoming feminised, so the theory goes. Uh, more women than men are likely to, 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 you know, to live longer, to, you know, to, to, to achieve some kind of longevity. Again, that's to do with gender socialisation, men take more risks, etc. Uh, women tend to be more surveillance about their bodies and their health. And, and that translates, we can say, into women living uh, a little bit longer. Uh, so the ratio of men um, in... Uh, the last census, if you like, uh, was for, uh, si uh, sorry, to women aged 65 plus in the UK was for every 100 men, there were 154 women. So <coughs> for every one man, there was just over one and a half women, women if you like. Okay? Now that goes up amongst the uh, over, over 85s, where women outnumber men by a factor of two to one. Again, these government statistics. And we know that these, these things, the situation, longevity can be affected or exacerbated <coughs> by the intersecting inequalities uh, of class, race, and, and other factors as well. I'm not going to dwell on those for the moment. Um, another key thing to bear in mind is that ONS estimates government says, that about two thirds of the people so accommodated um, are affected by a dementia. And I say a dementia because dementia is not one thing. There are various forms of dementia, and they affect people in uh, quite different ways. Let's not forget that there are some, there are some young old people 
in care homes, but one of whom appears in our research, uh, where you might get people affected by early onset of Parkinson's or dementia uh, and so on. Okay. Um, so how do we generate our data, our, our stories, our narratives? Well, we, we've decided to do some consultative research to ask people how useful is this research, how significant, and if you think it is, how should we go about doing it? So it's about feasibility. Is it doable? Uh, and if so, how, you know, how, should we, how should it be done? Um, and of course, if this resonates with good practice about including the people that you're writing about in the research that you're actually doing. Okay? And I guess Stuart is, also, is a kind of living embodiment of that, that particular thing as well. So, um, first of all, we, we decided to... Sorry, Stuart. <laughs> it's a bit, it's a bit uh, we decided to use semi-structured interviews because they give some kind of structure to the process, but also they allow a little bit of going off piece for you to hear things that you never anticipated. The unexpected, it allows the unexpected stories to emerge. Uh, we did this in two care homes in the northwest. Uh, two of our respondents were men, one were women. Uh, we also interviewed three spouses who were all female. We gender matched the interview so you didn't have a kind of powerful male academic interviewing an older working class woman, for instance. So we thought about um, asymmetries of power, if you like, differences of, of power and status. Okay? Uh, we also, so that we, we avoided them actually directly talking about what they did and didn't do or what they do now as sexual agents, we gave them vignettes and, and stories to look at to get them to talk in more generalities rather than and steering them away from, well, I used to like doing this, and this is my kind of preference, and on the kitchen, you know, on the kitchen table or wherever. We, we tried to avoid that, and I think we, we did not successfully succeed. In terms of the people who responded, they're all white, British, uh, and as far as we can tell from their stories, none identified as lesbian, gay, bi, uh, or trans. Okay. So it is a very small sample. The work that we're proposing would, would, would judiciously sample to include a r the range of sexual and gender difference. Uh, the other thing was uh, focus groups where we, we to target the, the carers, the professional carers. Again, two homes in the northwest. We used the same kind of format, the scenarios and images, and we ended up with one group of ten, imagine rather difficult to manage, of one group of six. So we've got a kind of uh, a cohort, a sub-cohort of about 16 people. And these included a variety of people, managers, dementia specialists, care, and some very insightful reception staff mm -hmm. who were able to give their perspective as well. We chose this method because um, it includes quite a lot of people in one uh, encounter, if you like, and also it, it gets people, people get discussing, it, it enables people to think more creatively to provide you with much more rich data than if you perhaps just interviewed uh, one person. Okay. Uh, and we also used a conference that we'd organised at the end of our data generation period of about 40 plus academics and professional carers to, to, to use as a kind of test bed to say, well, this is what we're finding. What do you think? How does it, it st stack up in terms of your reality and your practice? And I think we, we, we got quite an endorsement from them, didn't we? They recognised a lot of the uh, the things that we actually shared. Okay, I'm going to move on to the uh, one of the, the first main story. <laughs> this is me interviewing Jack William, uh, and it, the, 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 the message here is we don't do this research under any circumstances whatsoever. Uh, and there were various reasons for that. First of all, um, we can see in William's narrative uh, it negative. Nobody talks about it here. Nobody practices it. So there is that almost like an institutional conspiracy not to talk about sex and older care home residents, basically. We just live as we are, that's it. We've had our sex life way back. So he's internalised this idea that he's post-sexual. And in a sense, to kind of add in insult to injury, it shows how the, the depth and breadth of ages, how it works as a, as a kind of narrative, that William has actually inter internalised it and uses it to mock other uh, care home residents, when he says, have you seen some of these people in here? They're that bloody old, they've got cobwebs on them. Um, I think you should leave it alone, it's people's personal life. Now, we might say that's a real generational narrative, uh, a particular response to the idea of sex and talking about sex. Um, but there is a background to this as well. That the, the, maybe the, the broader context for William that you don't see here is that he, was, he recently experienced bereavement of his wife, um, he'd also had a stroke himself, so there were all kinds of loss going on within his own particular life. 
And also he did have some quite deep religious convictions as well. But methodologically, you'd have expected that he might have ab absented himself or exempted himself from this research. And this just shows you, doesn't it, how sometimes people can opt in to tell you, no, you shouldn't bloody do this kind of, this, this kind of research. So there's a kind of learning point uh, for me there. Now, the second one is a slightly different... It's, it's, it's a little bit more cautious still, but it's a slightly, it, it strikes a slightly different note. And this is Olivia. Olivia's in her 60s, and her husband, John... Uh, the same age, John has Parkinson's, he's 61. Uh, so they're you know, a relatively young couple, if you like. And John wasn't able to articulate too much, so Olivia did most of the talking. But they were a double act. And the, the amazing thing, the most moving thing about this story was that how they supported each other. And I thought, looking at what's going on in there, the way that they relate to each other, this is a caring thing happening on both sides. John is, is not just an object of care, but gives it back to her. So this is looking at care in a much more reciprocal kind of way. And the interesting bit of this story is that it, that it normalises intimacy. It's just togetherness. If you've been married for a long, long time, they just need each other. So I think what she's doing here is, is talking about how intimacy perhaps is, marks something that a history of intimacy and self-understanding that's built, been built up over many, many years. And indeed, in their relationship, intimacy has replaced the kind of rumpy pumpy sex, if you like, um, but still in a, in a very satisfying way. On the other hand, she says, it's a very private thing. I don't want people to know what I kind of like to do, what my preferences are. So she's signaling the, the need for some kind of sensitivity about how questions, what questions are asked and how they're actually framed. But also, she talks about an institutional impediment, a barrier to intimacy. They won't leave us with, they have a no closed door homicide when I'm there. How can I cook them? How can we have that moment of privacy if they have this, this policy? Uh, she says, I know, and even, I know there are some double rooms, but there's not that many. So she couldn't stay overnight with him to have an intimacy that she might have wanted anyway. So again, there are institutional barriers to this. We can't even have a cuddle lying down. And at the end of a rather long speech on their behalf, she turns to him and says, oh, do you, do you still have appetites, James? Uh, James is not his real name, by the way. Um, and, so, and James, sorry, John, says, do, do bear shit in the nuts. So I think this is a really important interjection because what he's, what he's saying is that I may not be able to do it anymore but I am still psychologically a sexual citizen, a sexual being, if you like. Uh, what, another interesting thing about our research is that you're tackling the wrong age group. Maybe he was kind of saying that, you know, with, with the kind of 80, 85 plus, it may not appear relevant to them. But there were one or two for whom it was a still kind of ongoing concern, okay? The third one is, this is Maria's interview with Emily. And Emily's point is a slightly more contradictory kind of story, uh, and her basic message was, well, yeah, it's kind of important, uh, but in context of many other things as well. You need to kind of put it in perspective, and I think that's a really interesting note about wholeness, about assessing and providing holistically. Uh, and Emily's asked by Maria, how important, what, it, what do you think it means, sexuality means to residents? Oh, not a lot. She went on forever, didn't she, Maria? She chatted and chatted, she's very chatty. Uh, well, it's just one of those things with older people that they might have forgotten what it was like or can't be bothered. So she's kind of tipping into that story about, well, you know, we're all a little bit past the time. Um, but then she says she marks an openness to being a sexual citizen again. So maybe, maybe the, what's going on here is a little bit more fluid. because She says, I suppose if you became friendly with one, another resident, things might change. So again, it's kind of openness there. But as far as I'm aware, there's no double rooms here, another institutional barrier. You've got to remember this generation like mine. Um, you had your husband. Then when he died, she stopped, basically. Uh, for our generation, it, being sex, was taboo. They've got grandchildren and gra children, grandchildren. Again, other priorities in their lives that you need to set this against. They've got enough on their plate. And here, we, I, 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 mm. it kind of makes people laugh, doesn't it? She says, somewhere they're glad when it's finished, some women aren't, basically. But even here, she's marking you know, the idea that there's a kind of difference. Some people may still be open to being a sexual citizen. Some people might rightly decide that it is rightly uh, no longer um, what they want to do, actually. Mm -hmm. Now, part of this view is, I'm going to hand over, hand over to Maria. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Right. 
Um, uh, by the way, with that last um, uh, quotation, um, I actually asked her whether she wanted to use the term intimacy or sexuality, and she preferred to use the term sexuality throughout the interview, so that I wasn't sort of forward feeding that. Okay, uh, I asked her which one she would prefer us to use. So just to clarify that for you. Okay, so in terms of partners' views, uh, we have um, two um, quotations really from uh, women whose husbands uh, both had dementia and were in the same um, care home. Um, Joan is one and Mavis is the other. And here, in terms of partners' views, although obviously a very small data set, we did identify four themes here. The first, first theme was around the, the, the issue of that intimacy was essential for a relationship, and particularly here to maintain a relationship once their partner had entered into a care home life. Uh, that was felt to be really, really important. And in some way, if, if you will, to maintain continuity of past behaviours, etc., and, and knowledge of what happened in the past, and, and build on that. And really, here to some extent, um, it builds on relationships that were previously had, uh, really based on Norman's work around reciprocity. So if there, if there was a good relationship, that tends to produce a, a, a lasting relationship, even if um, the other partner goes into a care home. So here John, to typify this, here John say, but to me it's just a way of showing my husband that I love him and I still want to hold his hand and kiss him. So she still feels that that's very important for John, but also for herself really, uh, as a reminder that you know that there, there is still this relationship, that they are still man and wife. The other theme here uh, we've identified was around human need and intimacy. And uh, really, this was, uh, really, both women expressed similar messages here in that actually, although the level of consciousness has changed, <coughs> identity and how these people engage with the world, and even, even if they have dementia, um, they're still able to appreciate touch and intimacy. That was felt to be important by both women. So here we have Joan saying, well, I just think people are looking for the same sense that they're loved and that they're touched and they're kissed and all that. So providing that sort of support and, and, and affection. And Mavis um, also in a similar vein saying, well, I couldn't express enough to you what it means for these uh, patients to be hugged. So that they just, you know, that somebody still does love them. Um, so that's really, um, I, I thought, quite, um, quite touching um, from these stories. The third theme was really, well, What's, what's right? Um, and here we have John expressing that really, well, um, we're husband and wife. If I want to sit on my husband's knee, I'll sit on my husband's knee. So he's quite resistant to these ageist attitudes and saying, well, I'll do what I, what I think we would normally be doing. Whereas actually Mavis is, is capitulising a little bit to those ageist attitudes, really. And she's saying, well, it'd be, it'd be nice sort of to, uh, I don't know, say lie on the bed with him and just give him a hug. But it wouldn't be right, and so she felt uncomfortable about showing the intimacy. Um, and it's interesting, actually, that the, the both both interviews that we have were with women, because there has been shown to be a gender differential and comfort around talking about or accepting sort of sexuality or talk about intimacy, and that sort of draws on from Duffy's work. And really, this is something I think that we perhaps need to explore further in subsequent research. Um, and that's the last theme under here. Um, again, resonates about other issues, and uh, really goes back to Jane Newell's work around entering care home and that transition of actually um, leaving known things behind. Um, that it's traumatic, you're entering into care, and therefore you're expected to give things up. And this actually could be compounded for people that may be lesbian, gay or transgender, that actually identities that were built up over a lifetime are, are going to actually rebuild again. And so quite, again, traumatic um, um, transition for them. And in terms of um, staff um, views, um, this is care home staff, and actually we did get um, a, a, quite a spectrum as Paul said, uh, from receptionists who were very intuitive actually, uh, right through the sort of the nursing genre. And really they recognised that in terms of sexuality and intimacy needs, it was, it was they recognised the common importance. Um, 
But there were a number of issues that they particularly faced around trying to create uh, an environment that, that, that they felt like home and could contribute to you know, an intimate environment. And these were really around many grey areas for them and where there were particular lack of clear direct policy, particularly around issues of consent. And when we think about care home residents, the majority do have some form of dementia, so there, was issue, there were issues around consent uh, and they didn't know where to draw the line, or, or whether they'd be held responsible or who was actually responsible for this. There were also things around altered behaviour, and again, we, going back to sort of uh, the majority type of uh, uh, care home residents, will have some form of dementia. Generally, with dementia, there is some sort of altered behaviour. And is it acceptable, for instance, that um, a married woman um, takes up a relationship with another resident? knowing that, that she has a spouse and these were very common issues that you know it sounds um, absurd but actually this, these were very common issues for care home staff and then there were you know how do I actually uh, as a professional deal with these types of issues is my role actually now safeguarding these people where do I stand with that or am I risk managing or am I being risk averse so really what that sort of smart talk well actually well we haven't got any clear direct policy or guidelines around this and actually I suggest that there needs to be more training um, in these areas to support staff perhaps in some of the decisions they may have to make and not just care home staff maybe work with families and relatives etc around these areas the other large area for staff was actually was a barrier to, uh, in terms of the environment and that was actually highlighted by residents and carers themselves but actually it was re also recognised by staff that actually intimacy was actually designed out of care homes and that again draws on the work actually of Trish, Trish isn't it um, um, Got a uh, double barrel there, hang on. <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah, Trish Halford, let let Bill's work. Uh, the, uh, yes, it is designed out, so it's not you know, so we don't have many double rooms. We don't have private spaces, and there is this sort of intersection between well, what public space and what is private space, and how can can we ma ma manage the two within such an environment? It's also difficult to talk about for some people. Uh, and also there were many taboos and misunderstandings around um, you know, what is intimacy, what is sexuality, should we be encouraging that, should we be discussing it? I find it difficult to discuss, I'm, not, I'm going to find it even more difficult to discuss that with an older adult. So if it's hard to talk about uh, amongst themselves, it's obviously very difficult to talk about with residents. And then staff attitudes, actually. Karen here is saying, you know, people with disabilities can still have sex. It's just a possibility, uh, possibly, possibly the age factor uh, with the disability. Now here, um, she's actually being very honest. Uh, and what she's saying is actually there, there is a need for uh, training um, to actually unpack a lot of these issues. Um, and uh, feelings of discomfort. So, sorry, moving on, yeah. So, not only in terms of care home staff, but also residents themselves and uh, family members, the need for training for them and maybe engaging in this process so that when we look at difficult issues around consent and, and altered behaviour, we're able to manage that hopefully more effectively. Speaking on. So, take home messages. Um, well, residents' responses did vary. Um, we have, obviously, from the first quotation, you know, don't do it. It's a terrible thing you're doing. Um, leave it alone. Or pr proceed, but be sensitive and mindful about the fact that, you know, people do enter all the age, and it might be a very difficult conversation, and you may not wish to talk about it. But that needs to be placed in context of other needs and wishes. In terms of spouses, well, for them, people we interviewed actually stressed the importance of intimacy within their relationship. It was a way of keeping their partner real and the memories of their partner. Um, so for them, really, um, 
intimacy was important. And I would suspect that on, on, uh, in these interviews, they had good relationships. So it was around that emotionally aggressive process saying that there's something that was built up over a lifetime and shouldn't stop just because a partner's um, moved into a care home. There were also highlighted grey areas of appropriateness, which actually made us highlighted. In terms of care home staff, well, really, it was important. Um, they raised it as an important tissue and a neglected area within, within the scope of their care. Um, they were starved of policies, really. They needed policies, they needed guidance. And I suppose, really, in, in, in the age of litigation and, and um, everything we've heard about, this is sort of use cases, etc., this heightens their anxiety, and quite rightly so. So th there needs to be uh, really some clear guidelines and policies around that so that actually they feel that they're doing the right thing. Um, and there's issues around actually um, uh, trying to control and manage the problem. And I think we need to unpick and unpack what that problem is. Um, so back to staff training and support, they felt that was important for them. And actually important maybe also looking at the environment um, and saying, is, it fit, is the environment fit for purpose uh, in the modern society? Do things need to change? <coughs> Should there be a cultural shift? Also, I think I'm minded, although not on here, is that actually this was largely British population, all white, and so I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that actually there might be cultural and all religious dimensions here as well that actually we will need to explore further. Um, Paul, I think, do you want to do the recommendations? Um, you I can do. No, you carry on. <laughs> <laughs> no, carry on. You need to finish. Um, all right. Well, just as it says on the tin, I suppose. Mm. Um, from the yes, from the care. I think, I think there's more appetite for guidance from uh, the carers. Mm. Really, wasn't there? They they were more, much more strongly in favour. There's a little bit more ambiguity from the the actual residents mm. themselves. I think, as we've seen. Um, I have to stress though mm. that when they were calling for guidance, it wasn't to manage a problem. Mm. It was actually to, to enable people. Yeah. It, was to, it was to enable human dignity, wasn't it? To yeah. enable people to, mm. to do what they actually wanted to do, things that were actually right for them, basically. Um, but there's, uh, they're definitely calling for <coughs> a, a, an intimacy and sexuality policy for care, because it's not just evidence based. Mm but also develop not just with care staff, but also with residents mm -hmm. uh, themselves. Well. So it's a, it's a kind of institutional kind of document that everybody can have some kind of stake in, and some input to. And of course, that document will need to change as our society, as people change, and as things progress, basically. Um, there was a d distinct need for staff training in sexuality and intimacy issues, uh, you know, in relation to what Mary has just described. Um, what, what is appropriate? How can we enable people? Uh, what are the boundaries, mm -hmm. uh, how can it be communicated, how should it be uh, implemented. Uh, a need also to increase, aware this is perhaps where the culture change comes in as well, but uh, an increased awareness of specific LGBT and ISEs. Now, there is a need for some work to be done, particularly with the care home residents, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. So it's not just training the staff, but maybe events that everyone in the home, <coughs> consciousness raising events that everyone in the home can actually be involved in so that we can people can be maybe get over some of those generational anxieties around sexual and gender difference. Uh, and I guess what this particular recommendation is aiming at, as far as I see anyway, is that if care homes operate well, they can operate as communities and not just places where people to go, not just like in God's waiting room, for instance. Um, okay. Um, there was a a really big um, push, I suppose, for how we should all work together as for, to, to normalise uh, various issues of uh, sexuality and intimacy. And again, uh, a lot of work to be done to, uh, together about how we can overcome <coughs> barriers to sexuality and intimacy, both organisational, um, physical, uh, but also perhaps in the minds of people as well. Okay. Um, and just to remind you um, that the research that we've done at the moment hopefully will be a stepping stone to something bigger, some kind of national research, even cross-national with our colleagues in Australia. I mean, there are some machinations and movements there that we're just kind of waiting to hear about uh, whilst our colleague builds up 
uh, the relationship with other people in Australia, and then we could think about some kind of cross-national endeavour. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I think work's been done there uh, around actually developing. But in terms um, of developing impact yeah. and toolkits that people could, practical things that people could <coughs> do in the context of care. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being. Okay. Cheers. Uh, the Opus team, as I said, this is us. Um, we are a range of people. It's myself, Laura in psychology, Tommy nursing, Maria in nursing at Bradford, Christine health in Queensland, Kate, who I've spoken about, and Stuart, uh, who we're going to hear, hear from in a few moments. And we also have on board, uh, well, Phil may have pulled out, but he's, we're hoping that a colleague will replace him, but Dental, which is the uh, Degenerative and Neurological Diseases Research Network. That sounds like a terrible mouthful. But what they do is that they, uh, they, they, one of their functions is to put researchers, people like us, in touch with uh, research-ready care hubs. So care hubs who are used to dealing with, to, to building up relations with and taking part in, in academic uh, and other kinds of research. And also they're, they're also a part of the, the NHS as well. Okay. Um, so we, we do, in a moment, or in a few months, we will welcome your questions and comments. But for the time being, I'm going to hand over to Stuart <coughs> to do his, his piece, looking at concerns from a range of people in uh, Age Concern Manchester's LGBT group. Thank you. Um, I don't know if stay oh, here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I'm Stuart Smith, and I'm a, a member of an older LGBT group called Out in the City in Manchester. And I'm about to read to you the thoughts of some of the members about sexuality and care homes. Perhaps I should say about the group, we have days out, a drop-in, and a monthly coffee morning provided by Hard Rock Cafe. Right, so to begin with uh, some of the views of uh, some of the members of the group. <clears throat> I am a 74-year-old man recently diagnosed with Parkinson's. I live with a partner. At the moment, I am largely independent, although my partner gives me a lot of help to overcome the effects of the stiffness of the joints and impaired mobility, which are the main features of the condition. I realize that this situation will probably deteriorate with time and that moving to a care home may become a strong possibility. Like many aging people, I do not view this prospect with much enthusiasm. I really value my independence and find the thought of giving it up very depressing. I feel that in today's Britain, the old and the vulnerable are not valued, so that I assume the possibility of being able to choose from a wide range of care options is rather unlikely. I don't expect that it would be easy to live with my partner. I also find that there is more homophobia among people of my generation, so that I would be very worried about coming up against a negative reaction to my sexuality. I have very little experience of care homes and fear the situation of being looked after by uncaring staff, have we have seen, as we have seen in recent media coverage I realize that journalistic coverage often tends to oversimplify and distort an issue, so that I assume there are many care homes doing excellent work. But at the same time, I can't help worrying that my increasing age and my perceived diminishing usefulness to society are putting me in a position where my control over my life could be severely diminished. <clears throat> this next one identifies as both trans and bisexual, which complicates gender and sexuality. There are a whole lot of issues surrounding care for elderly trans people, but they can be summarized as follows. As a trans woman, I will need care from an organization and individuals who respect the fact that my gender presentation and behavior is at variance from my physical body. It will be helpful if they do not make assumptions about my sexuality. I see myself as bisexual, 
so I might have a male or female partner. If I don't have a partner, I may be attracted to either men, women, or both. Um, this is from someone else. It may well be that you are more likely to end up in a care home if you are an only child and all your family are gone. <coughs> in those circumstances, what happens if you do encounter problems or abuse and you have nobody to fight your corner? I would think in those circumstances there was even more pressure to hide one's sexuality. <clears throat> in the past I have had mental issues and have more than once been hospitalised. I have always found that the nurses and orderlies on a psychiatric ward have always been sympathetic and friendly and always find time to chat to patients and never questioned my sexuality. So I think that staff of care homes should be given a certain amount of training in mental health and especially be taught to understand the problems faced by LGBT people and made aware that they will certainly encounter LGBT people in the course of their work and not have an attitude of, oh, we don't have anybody here like that. <coughs> we all have a male side and a female side. One only needs to watch footballer, footballers to realise this. <coughs> I did say something else to that, but I won't say it. <laughs> I'll leave it out. <coughs> now, someone else says, why not have a gay care home? We should have a, a gay home. We would be understood. We would not have to explain ourselves. We would enjoy our freedom. Same-sex couples should have a room together. Going into a nursing home after illness fills me with dread. But I suppose that is the same for straight people, though they often have children who will check that they are being properly looked after. Part of my dread is because I am not completely open about being gay and apprehensive about how a nursing home and other residents would react. I think I would be happy if there was a gay-friendly or gay-only home. <coughs> Excuse me. Problems... Problems between carers and trans people who have not had surgery, which may be for medical reasons, or they may not be able to have surgery, or it may be that they don't want to have surgery, even though they are taking medication. How would practitioners address this issue? Um. It shouldn't matter what your sexuality is, whether you are in a care home or not. Would you have any more dignity if you were considered straight? If so, there is something very wrong with the system that doesn't allow for equality among all groups. And that should apply to every gender, religion or disability. Would you discriminate or even ask what religion a person is? What right do you have to ask someone about their sexuality? All staff should have diversity training, not assume all people are heterosexual, thus making it necessary for the gay person to repeatedly come out. <coughs> Moving into a care home, it's something like dying. We choose not to think about it. I would have hope at least that if the worst comes to the worst, to have some sort of control of which one I would go into. It is ironic that we spent the first years of our life hiding our sexuality and hiding it again at the end. I have no experience of care homes, but I'm sure I would not like it if I felt I couldn't be myself.
that's it, I've finished. Thank you. I think you've uh, you very neatly summarised to a whole range of reasons why consistently LGBT people say that their biggest fear later in life is actually being taken into care. Mm. Kind of mm. okay. mm -hmm. um, I think that's the our, our panel concluded. That, um, open the floor for questions and, and ideas and thoughts. Uh, just to say a bit about myself, I'm Paul Lowndes, I'm a reader in sociology and social philosophy in the Department of Social Sciences. I'm also co-convener of the International Network for Sexual Ethics and Politics, the cover of the journal of which is there, and some flyers for the journal of which are there. Uh, we convene international networks doing interesting and innovative work on sexual ethics and politics, unsurprisingly. And if you're interested and you leave your email with me, I will put you on our email list so you'll receive regular emails of the sort of things we do in the events we hold, uh, which are mainly in Europe but also globally. And what I'm going to do today is just give some reflections on what I think is a really, really important development in sex and sexuality research, which is the sort of work Paul and Marie are doing. Uh, and let's make no bones about this. Uh, this is not a minority and slipstream interest. Uh, if the last 30 years were the discovery of the child in terms of ethics, health and politics, the next 40 will be the discovery of older people as citizens in their own right. Uh, political parties, however dishonest and underhand they are, are not stupid and those of you astute will notice all the political parties sending messages to the increasing what they call grey vote. So this issue for that reason is going to be extraordinarily important and therefore Paul's work is at the head of some very important things we need to develop and think about uh, in order to get ahead of that agenda. Probably the other thing to say as well is we need to think very, very carefully about what we're talking about in terms of intimacy and sexuality. Because it's quite clear that while we have a genitocentric, penetrative stereotype of young people vigorously thrusting around each other, uh, when we talk more broadly about sex and older people, we are in part talking about masturbation, the use of pornography, mutual masturbation, voyeurism, wider set of activities. There is some small research and anecdotal evidence, for example, that those people who practice BDSM sexuality practice it with far more sense of continuity in their sex lives into their 60s and 70s than many who would regard themselves as heterosexual or gay or lesbian and whose sexuality is mainly more genitocentric. So we've got to think creatively about what this means in terms of people engaging first in their intimacy and second in their sexuality. And I think we do, in a sense, have to make that difference, although they are intersecting, because intimacy can mean lots of things which would never touch the notion of sexuality. And I want to concentrate on three broad themes. And let's start with the first one. Always a good way to start. And there is a generational paradox here, and another reason why this issue is going to become extremely important in the next 10 to 15 years. And that is that we are beginning, just beginning, to have the generation who experience a sexual revolution coming through to their 60s and 70s in care homes. The traditional sexual, model of sexuality and sexual knowledge in society, the traditional sexual culture which deemed people who were older could not be sexual, and should indeed internalise that and express themselves as not being sexual, that generation is being superseded in care homes and in other institutions and practices and professional practices that deal with older people by a generation who will say, no, wait a minute, we've had this debate, we are sexual, we've been sexual all our lives, it's a lot more open for us, why should we put up with? And therefore, progressively, as this generational shift happens over the next 10 to 15 years, this is going to be something increasingly which becomes a matter of contention. 
And of course there are technologies and pedagogies or forms of learning people can do which enhance their sex life. We only need to think of one, which is Viagra, which extends the male capacity to maintain an erection. And so with those technologies, and we think about video technologies, computer technologies, interactive sex on the web, what we get is a greater degree of people being able to elongate their sexual imagination, sometimes necessarily beyond their physical capacities. Paul has used the term in his writing erotophobia, the idea that we tend to think the old cannot be erotic, cannot be sexual. But that is going to change. Now, it's certainly going to change and has begun to change in some areas we might have more caution about, particularly in relation to commodities, abuse and, and oppression. Uh, the porn market, while completely unreliable in relation to consenting sex, is very interesting in terms of giving us some guidelines to what people want to watch. And one of the big explosions in porn in the last five to ten years has been the old and young market which reflects an older generation wanting to watch porn and fantasy porn about themselves with younger people. So there is a fetishistic porn which at least tells us there is the beginnings of a commodity relationship which the old will buy into. And in that respect, you will find certainly that producers of porn, producers of text toys, producers of cinema will begin to play on that in order to sell their goods. Of course, the issue of citizenship is important. We've talked about citizenship and sexuality uh, for about 20 years now. Uh, it's not clear what sexual citizenship is. And one of the big criticisms of sexual citizenship is that when you get a proportional or equivalent legal e equality in things like marriage, that's where the agenda changes. But I don't think that's the case. I think we will have a more sexualized citizenship where the intimate and personal and sexual becomes more important in our lives, in our workplace, in our social context, in the public sphere as well as the private sphere. And that's going to lead from legal prohibitions, the law says we should not do this, the law says this is impermissible, to the development of positive engagement. To use uh, famous philosopher Isaiah Berlin's two forms of freedom, from freedom from something, like abuse, to freedom to something, freedom to engage sexually. And this facilitation, when we think about people who work alongside older people, is going to increasingly move from being at the absolute discretion and possible danger to people who work with older people and will take risks breaking the code of conduct or code of practice to be intimate, to give a hug at one level, or to facilitate sex at another, <coughs> to actually more of a facilitation. It may well be discretionary, you may well be able to opt out, but somebody is going to come along and can embrace this issue. Uh, at the moment I'm doing some work on, on which relates to the third theme I'm going to pick up on, which is with a number of organisations, growing number of organisations, who want both, and I don't like the word training, let's call it an educative experience and also help developing guidelines for what you do with those who lack the capacity to consent but should still have the right to a good sex life. Uh, it's an incredible challenge to actually work along around the legal element of consent, what consent culturally means, and the idea that we might want to envisage forms and exceptions where people who are People are not able to give their consent, or their consent is unreliable, but we still want to be free from harm, but enjoy a sex life. Uh, that equation is incredibly difficult, it's going to take a while to unpick, but I'm sure with a group of organisations we're putting together, we'll be able to do that. So, there is a grey and third age rights agenda, and sex will increasingly be a part of it, and it will include the question of diversity, it will include the fact. I mean, one of your respondents said, why aren't there gay uh, care homes? I would suspect in the next five to ten years, what you'll get, whether or not it's good or what you want, are homes that's at, that brand themselves and advertise as gay. Or they'll follow the pub trade and they'll be gay friendly, by which we mean money friendly. There's also a second reflection brought up by Paul and Marie's work and the team's work, is the whole notion of the professional. 
And it was interesting to hear people talk about their professional role. We know there's a traditional model of the professional as the authoritative voice, detached, austere, behind their knowledge. We also know, for those of us who work in the area of professional practice, that we are trying to develop within our students a critical and reflexive professional, someone who reflects on their role in their context, someone who understands the political context they work in and the implications it has for them, somebody who recognises the scope and limits to the institutions they work for. That critical reflexive practitioner will question, they'll reflect, and they will try to move forward the agenda even as they fulfil their role. We also know, of course, that there is, if you look at the work of Ivan Illich and David McKnight, a sense of disabling amongst professionals. Professionals who identify a problem without listening to the people that they're dealing with and then develop a solution and then usefully develop the way you measure your performance in the solution and not surprisingly, usually it's very, very good. There are therefore a number of models of professional and that at least raises the notion we have to be careful when we talk about what professional practice is. And as I said in my last comment from the floor, what's the scope and limits of the professional role? If we begin to talk about facilitation, we might talk usefully about being okay about ordering a professional sex worker to come in and do something. But if facilitation involves more than that, what is the scope and limits of the professional role? It's one thing to want people to enjoy a healthy sex life until they die. It's quite another to think about your professional role in relation to permitting that, developing the context within which that can happen and facilitating that or even intervening to ensure it. We have to think therefore about the professional client relationship and how far that professional client relationship with older people, particularly those with dementia or Alzheimer's or such, involves some very, very complex judgments about what your role is at various times. Because, of course, you want to be consistent, you want to be coherent and understood by other stakeholders, and you have to work within a context, regrettably, where we are, one of the many things we're exporting from America, unfortunately, is a litigious culture, where people will sue if you're out of step. You need to think about what the professional point of intervention is. There are advanced directives. The problem with advanced directives is it's uneasy as to what weight they hold in law. What weight they will actually hold if you have an advanced directive when you are well and then you become unable to consent and then your family question the advanced directive. There are whole sets of problems around that. So what is your point of intervention? And I think it points to perhaps looking at the collaborative professional and team professional work with different disciplines, taking a lot more holistic and joined up approach to how we deal with people who are in need of particular services. And there are questions of intrusion and demarcations of space. What happens behind closed doors? The problem with the prevention and abuse agenda is it ties you to a notion that you must think of harm first. And of course you must. But if there are two people behind a closed door and the decision is whether to open it and see or close it, and how you determine whether people behind that door are not in harm, that's an incredibly difficult uh, decision to make. At the moment, as much as most people here don't appear to like it, there's actually a very easy solution in the law, which is you open the door and you make sure that no harm takes place. But we might want to question that view, and we might want to question how far we engage in people's lives and how far that might be an intrusion in their lives. And questions of thinking about how the thinking of intimacy and sex stimulates a rethinking of the organisation of care. When I read Paul's work, and I've read a few bits of Paul's work in preparation uh, to actually talk about this. One of the things that struck me, in the way it normally does when you don't really think about something until you read it and think about it, not enough homes with, with double beds. I mean, come on. It's basic. It's basic that you'd have. More broadly, how do we work in terms of the organisation of care 
when issues like sex and intimacy would suggest we need to give more bespoke services. And within the context of a generic service, actually be facilitative of people's different needs and wants to a greater degree. That has enormous implications, I think, for public spending, for example. And finally, and direct, directly, the notion of consent itself, which I spent probably 20 years thinking about and come to the conclusion that I'm no wiser than I was 20 years ago. Uh, I think we have to be very clear about what consent is. Valid consent recognised by the law and the lack thereof is informed, competent and free from coercion. We can talk about capacity as long as you want. Capacity or competence is one of the three criteria. The law generally is there for protection. It's part of the safeguarding and, pre and protection agenda. The law is there largely to regulate what is considered risky and to prohibit what is considered dangerous. And unfortunately, sex historically was considered both risky and dangerous. And of course, when you think about the epidemic of rape in the UK and the epidemic of sexual assault short of rape, uh, there's a very, very good reason why the law should act in that way. But we probably have come to the point where the law needs a next generation, which is far more joined up with the policing and judiciary system, and perhaps the care system, in judging when consent may be unreliable or lacking, but we can satisfy ourselves that harm is minimised, and therefore we can allow, with a suitable code of ethics, such as care of the self, care of the other, and feminist care ethics are useful here, a framework by which we can allow people to have sex without the certainty of legal consent. But it's extremely difficult because consent is the gold standard. We need to draw on a, on a broader agenda, and that's currently work which uh, I think is extremely important, which is why I'm working on it. <laughs> So it's the protection agenda versus reasonable, necessary and sufficient conditions. What's necessary to protect, what's sufficient to protect are two different things. What's necessary to respect people's dignity and what is sufficient? And I suspect it's going to get messy somewhere in the middle. So. It's going to get more and more important. We're going to have to, I think, increasingly prioritise the dignity and experience of older sexual people. And not just them. There are other areas in sexuality we're going to have to do that as well. And that has significant implications for law, professional practice and sexual ethics. And I think I would certainly relate that to the idea of sexualised citizenship. I don't believe you can enjoy a healthy sex life with a thought at the back of your head that there are people who can't. Uh, and then I think especially when you think you're part of a system that actually doesn't allow them to. It's one thing to say someone can't enjoy a healthy sex life because it consists of a desire to rape. And that I think you think you prohibit. But the idea of enjoying a healthy sex life and thinking that makes me happy and makes me feel good, but I'm part of a system that doesn't allow people who are already in need of other things mm. to also have that sex life, seems to me against any model of human dignity. Mm. Training is important, but there are limits to the training agenda. I think you have to have more radical thinking and hopefully part of what Paul and Marie and the team's work is pushing forward will do that. I'm, as I said, a philosopher. That means I don't really like people and hate doing any proper research. I just stand <laughs> up and shout a few ideas up and try to look clever. But I think somewhere between the sort of philosophical work that we do and the empirical work we do and the participation of the sort of people in this room and the spread of social workers, mm. care workers, academics, there's a real possibility we can change things for the better. And that's about as optimistic as I've ever been in 25, 30 years of public speaking. So that's your lot. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you.